There's some things that, again, you cannot buy or that if you want to try to get yourself, will take you a lot of time. And time is the one resource that you cannot spend money on. Welcome to Layer Zero. Layer Zero is a podcast of unscripted conversations with the people that make up the Ethereum community. Crypto is built by code, but it's composed by people. And each individual member of the crypto community has their own story to tell. Cypherpunks understood that the code they write impacts the people that use it, and Layer Zero focuses on the people behind the code, because Ethereum is people all the way down, and it always has been. Today on Layer Zero, we're talking with Haseeb Qureshi of Dragonfly Capital. And Haseeb, we've had him on the Bankless podcast before, uh, but always to talk about some sort of a thesis or, or mental model. And instead, in this particular episode, we talk about just the dynamics of being a venture capitalist in Web3. Uh, and so if you are interested in learning how, what's it like to be a VC and also what it might be like for you to find a path into becoming a VC, this might be the episode for you. Um, I think everyone, at least most people, when they get into the world of crypto, always kind of daydream about like one day they'll be a part of a venture capital fund and one day they'll be on the research desk. And I certainly had that that dream myself. And kind of growing through the industry, I realized it wasn't necessary necessary for me. But if that is what you are interested in, this episode is going to be perfect. Uh, we talk about, you know, what, it, what it's like to establish relationships with, with your portfolio companies. We talk about what it's like to add value to por your portfolio companies. We also talk about the timing on when it becomes time to actually sell your investments and how you credibly and honorably actually find liquidity uh, on the projects that you've had relationships with and, and what that means. And we also get into the concept of um, airdrops, whether airdrops are going to be here for the long term or they were, they, maybe they were just kind of a 2020 to 2021 thing and really what it means to have a th long term thesis in Web3 versus just kind of looking at what's going on in the present moment. Uh, so a really w wide ranging conversation all about kind of investing in crypto, as we all do. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this conversation with Haseeb Qureshi right after we get to some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need L2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest and cheapest and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about the long wait times or high fees to get your assets back to the Layer 1. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic Oracle to securely transfer tokens from Layer 2 back to Ethereum. Across is critical ecosystem infrastructure and ownership is being handed over to the community. You can be a part of this story of Across by joining the Discord and becoming a co-founder and helping to design the fair fair launch of Across. If you want to bridge your assets quickly and securely, Go to across.to to bridge your assets between ETH, Optimism, Arbitrum, or Boba Networks. Bankless is proud to be sponsored by Uniswap. Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum that lets you trade any token at the current market price. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. The Uniswap Grants Program is accepting applications for grants. Do you have something of value that you think you want to contribute to the Uniswap ecosystem? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at uniswapgrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. If you're going bankless, you need MetaMask. This is your tool to unlock the world of DeFi without giving up custody over your private keys. MetaMask is both a secure in-browser wallet and also a secure bridge for your hardware wallet. You can now trade tokens on any DEX or aggregator. MetaMask Swap gathers real-time pricing information across all the DeFi exchanges, allowing you to select your best price while getting all the MetaMask benefits of self-custody, lower gas costs, and increased transaction success rates. MetaMask also has a fantastic mobile wallet that I use when I'm out and about which I use to collect PO apps, NFTs, and do all my DeFi things while I'm away from home. If you haven't downloaded MetaMask, you gotta try it out. Web3 wouldn't be the same without it. Download MetaMask for desktop and mobile at metamask.io and load up your Trezor, Ledger, Lattice, or Keystone hardware wallets so that they too can get into the world of Web3. What's up, Asib? How's it going? I am doing well. How about yourself? Pretty good, pretty good. Currently uh, stuck between extremely bullish about the merge, but extremely bearish about most everything else. 
Yeah, that is reasonable. There's been a lot of good news about the merge. Um, there has also been a lot of bad news in the world. So <laughs> I think I agree with you. It does feel like we're in crypto. There's like a little bit of narrative exhaustion. It feels like mm -hmm. uh, people are people are getting a little bit tired of hearing the same old stories. Uh, but I don't know. I, I I feel like fundamentals still look really good. So I'm I'm feeling confident. Yeah, yeah. Same narrative exhaustion is definitely one, but also I think I've gotten a sense of like bull market exhaustion over the last like mm. two months. Maybe kind of the same thing, just like oh, like sweet another play to earn game. Oh, sweet another yeah. like NFT profile picture thing. All right, all right. Like we're done with that. Talking about the merge again. All right, like cool. We've been talking about that for a while. It's just like how many like crypto runs on attention, and sometimes like well like. DeFi tokens, that was the thing that invigorated us in 2020. And then that kind of right. like spun out. And then NFTs, that kind of ran its course and the gaming. And then it seems to be like in bull markets, we have these iterative cycles of new things that can capture people's attention. But eventually, like the sparkly new ideas kind of run out and then people kind of like sober up. And it kind of feels like where we are right now. Well, macro is definitely the driver's seat this year. And mm -hmm. it's also, you know, Bitcoin and ETH are doing most of the talking for the crypto market, which is which is also a sign that, like, again, it's primarily about macro. Uh, that at that at the same time, you know, I remember in January, we were getting so many gaming pitches. It was like five metaverse pitches a week. It was like just exhaustingly repetitive. That's slowing down. So I'm definitely mm -hmm. seeing less kind of metaverse automatically raise tons of money hype. It feels like people are investors are starting to catch on. Um I am still seeing a lot of DAO infrastructure, but I was seeing a lot of that a month ago. We were seeing like so many people telling the same story about DAO infrastructure, DAO infrastructure sucks, we're gonna build better tools for DAOs. That's finally slowing down. Uh -huh. um, and so now it, it does feel like there's a little bit of a dearth of ideas. You know, there was, a, we went through a few cycles of like, okay, you know, DeFi on new L1s, and then it was metaverse, and then it was DAO infrastructure. And now I'm like, I'm not sure what the pattern matching, like, okay, here's the startup of DeJour, is um, mm -hmm. uh, but it does feel like there's I'm seeing more follow-ons from previous you know companies that already have established uh, their their businesses, um, and I'm seeing less interesting things happening at the very very early stages right now. So when you're uh, engaging with all of these like startups, these seed opportunities, angel investment opportunities, uh, well, not angel investment for me, seed investment. What, seed investment what, for what us. is is yeah seed investment for you? Yeah, uh, how do you keep yourself like at an, how do you keep the bull market mania at arm's length and also still do your job? How do you, how do you balance those two things? Well, the, the nice thing is that at seed, um, the market has fairly limited impact on seed, right? So seed, like it, seed prices go up, seed prices go down. It kind of depends on the supply of capital. Um, but, uh, what's happening in public markets tends to have limited impact on what's happening there. It, it the public markets have more and more impact on later stage rounds. It's, it's you can kind of imagine like a, um, almost like a spring, and it's like really hard to push that spring all the way down to seed. Um, but it, you know, Series D, Series E, Series C, they get affected pretty rapidly by changes that are happening in public markets. But the effect of that push and pull is um, is not only graduated, but it's also uh, there's some latency in how long it takes for that to show up in seed. So for the most part, public markets don't affect seed too much. Um, it's more about ideas and more about like what markets are hot that are driving entrepreneurs in a particular direction, right? So you see more concentration of ideas uh, in certain areas when those things are hot in public markets. Um, so, you know, like you mentioned, there are always NFT projects raising, there's always NFT studios, there's always things that are um, uh, kind of things that are tethered to the themes that are exciting in public markets. Um, but for the most part, you can kind of ignore what's happening in publics when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at seed series deals, when you go further afield to like series A and beyond, then it really starts to matter. So how do you like Axie Infinity, for example, like the Axie Infinity alone triggered an absolute mania in play to earn games like that. This one thing like started to move billions of dollars of capital outside of its own token uh, into like, you know, play to earn games. The next Axie, we want to be the next Axie was like a line for a really, really long time. Uh, but like when you invest these things in these things, like your minimum locked up for a year and usually much more, more than that. And so you have no amount of like guarantees that like, you know, the play to earn gaming thing is going to be around, let alone three months, like in, in three months, let alone like you one plus years. So uh, how do you, how do you um, just manage 
like, well, play to earn games is a really hot topic right now. And maybe the fundamentals are there, but, and we do want exposure to that concept, but, and so like, you know, that like, yes, this is an investable theme, but are the game, are the startups that are coming to my, my desk right now going to be the thing that actually capitalize on that? Like, I guess it's another reframing of the same question, just like the mania and demand for it's like, oh, like play to earn gaming. We got to invest in that versus like, well, is it really going to be a, year, a thing in a year again? How do you, how do you navigate those waters? Yeah. I mean, you, you, that's precisely the right way to think about it is that yeah. um, it's not enough to say this thing is hot right now. You have to draw the economics forward and really understand like, look, by the time that we get liquidity on our investment and the things that we're investing in now, which are pre-launch games, like from pre-launch game to actually getting a game in the market and monetize. And then you're, you know, you start, uh, uh, you know, the token gets launched and your lockup eventually starts to expire and you start getting liquidity. That is going to be multiple years. Mm -hmm. And so it's really not a question of what is Axie Infinity being valued at by the market today. The right question is, where do you think this market's going to be in three years? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for us, or I would say for me personally, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm very bearish on this current generation of play to earn gaming. Um, I don't think it's particularly sustainable. And, um, and I also, I mean, look, I've been in crypto long enough to know that like, although in general, you should assume that markets are smarter than you are and that markets are forward looking. Um, in crypto, I think those are both bad assumptions, <laughs> depending on who you are. Um, so uh, I, I generally speaking, you know, I, I strongly take my own judgment over what the market's telling you. And uh, if, you know, I think, I think it's very likely that when we see, now we've backed a number of games um, and even games that are using play to earn style mechanics, but pretty much everybody we have backed, you know, when we ask them, like, what do you think of Axie Infinity? Their answer is that like, yeah, it's bullshit. Like it's not going to work. And, you know, you need to have sustainable token economics in order for, uh, to build a game with real longevity and the game's got to be fun. And, you know, the one thing that you'll never hear in the same sentence is Axie Infinity and fun. Uh, and in fact, you know, you go look up any content you could possibly find on Axie Infinity, 100% of it is about making money and 0% is about having a good time. And that has to reverse for crypto gaming to actually have legs. So the games that we're backing are like trying to be fun first. And the, the reality is that building a fun game takes time. Uh, you don't get a fun game by like doing a bunch of NFT pre-sales and land sales and this thing and that thing. And then like paying a bunch of people in the third world to play your game. That's not how you build a sustainable game economy. Right. You can't mint fun like you can mint a token. Unfortunately um, not. No, you can do that with NFTs, but not with, uh, <laughs> not with games. Um, maybe, maybe that is in hindsight, like how we reflect on this whole NFT mania is like, oh yeah, we figured out how to briefly mint fun. And then we built that <laughs> for all of its worth. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, you... I do think that in retrospect, when we look back on this sort of gen one of crypto gaming, mm -hmm. it's going to look a lot like gen one of tokens. Sure. sure. We're going to, we're going to have the same kind of embarrassment. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. People are going to be, people are going to look back and kind of be like, I was kind of right, but like, yeah, maybe I missed like the particulars mm -hmm. of why mm -hmm. this generation wasn't going to work. Right. Uh, w when you do your, your seed investing at, at Dragonfly, uh, do you like think about, is this going to outperform ETH or how do you try and gauge performance? Like what is your, what is your measure for return? Th that is or, or Bitcoin right or, or your preferred L1 asset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you generally want to be thinking of, look, am I, am I, is this a good risk adjusted return and risk adjusted relative to what? And the answer should be the, the risk and return profile of just beta, right? Which is buying Bitcoin or buying Ether. Um, that being said, you know, our, our venture funds can't just go and buy Ether. So that, that actually is not literally the counterfactual, but that's ultimately what our LPs are going to judge us on is, right. are you, is investing in you better than just buying the underlying? Um, and so that, yeah, that, that's the metric by which we try to judge our investments. And, uh, Hasib is switching gears a little bit, but also not totally, uh, you have a background in poker. Uh, can you Correct. talk about how poker has influenced your decision-making in these markets, especially the, the emotional ones? So poker, it's an interesting question. So, you know, most of the, you know, you're, most people are aware a lot of poker players have found their way into crypto. Mm -hmm. Um, but most of those poker players end up on the trading side. Uh, there are actually very few poker players I know of that have ended up on the venture side. Wow. And trading and venture require very different skill sets. So I think poker and trading have a lot of crossover in common. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there about risk management, controlling your emotions, um, thinking in terms of expected value, being probabilistic about you know understanding outcomes. Those are skills that poker trains you in that are very much rewarded in trading. Venture is 
a very different kind of business because in venture, <clears throat> so one, venture is driven by power laws, meaning that most things uh, make very little money or make no money, and then a few things make a ton of money. And so you're really betting on this like asymptotic return profile on each individual investment. And uh, trading is not like that. Right? Like most times trading, it's like, okay, it goes, it goes for you, it goes against you, but like you just need to be right more than 50% of the time and you're gonna make money. Um, whereas venture is like you make 100 bets and three of them are gonna pay for your entire fund and one of them is gonna be like a thousand X, right? That's what mm -hmm. venture looks like. And so the kind of thinking you need to do in venture is very different than the kind of thinking you do in poker um, because you constantly... It's very difficult to do math when you're dealing with power laws, right? Like right. the the uh, the convexity of individual bets is so high that something that like is most likely going to fail, but has a very small chance of paying off at a very very large amount of money. Um, there aren't a lot of things like that in poker. Um, the second thing about it that's different from poker is that um, venture is very relationship driven, and it's very it's an extremely iterated game. So. Venture is all about building your brand, building the way that people know you and think of you and building long-term relationships. Whereas poker famously is like, you know, it's like this hand, I just have to make money in this hand and I maximize value in this hand and that's it. And like, generally speaking, you not really, although obviously poker is an iterated game in the sense that you're playing the same people at the same table for multiple different hands, um, you're not really worried about, okay, I want to be nice to this guy so that next time around, you know, he's going to be nice to me. If, you know, I, I don't want to check raise him too hard because then he'll check raise me next time. Like usually in poker, it's like, no, I'm just going to check raise him and screw him and like exert as much pressure as you can. Unless you're thinking about like, okay, this guy's a fish and like I want to keep him happy because I want to keep him losing money to me next time and the time after that. But that's generally not a huge part of how poker is played. Uh, it's a fairly small factor in poker. Um, so those are ways in which I think venture, uh, poker doesn't really prepare you that well for venture. It prepares you very well for trading, but not very well for venture. And that's why I think you see very few poker players find their way into venture. Um, so that's, I, I feel like I've had to learn a lot of those skills really from scratch as a venture capitalist. Interesting. Yeah, I never really considered that dynamic, but the the zero sum versus positive sum games and the the um, the iterative game uh, aspect of of venture is is a brand new concept to me. So I definitely want to dive into that particularly. What aspects of venture are like positive sum, iterative, like you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, kind of th kind of thing? Like what what are the relationships that you're trying to establish that help you become a better venture capitalist? So there's a bunch of them. So um, beyond just you know creating a lot of value and putting out content that ends up becoming valuable in ways that are difficult to quantify, right? Like that's what brand is. Brand is sort of difficult to quantify relationships. We have lots of small relationships, a lot of people whom you've never met. That's brand. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know the 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 importance. If, if anything, in poker, it's actually the other way around. Uh, and in, in some ways, in trading, it's the other way around. In trading, you don't want people to know what you're doing. Uh, you don't want people to know that you're a really smart trader and that you're making a lot of money and that you're pushing these edges. Same thing in poker. In poker, generally, you actually don't want people to know you're good because if people know you're good, they won't play you. Um, and so in some sense, there's like an anti-value uh, to brand is that mm. having brand, unless it's like, you know, you're getting on TV and, or you're know, right. getting invited to these invite-only tournaments. Uh, but then there's, there's a big difference between like TV, we used, you know, we would often call them like TV poker players and then like real poker players. And like, you know, someone like Doyle Brunson, who's like, not actually very good anymore. He's like super, super old. You know, he's like kind of a TV famous poker player. Um, in a re in a real card game, he would actually be a terrible. He would be like a fish at the table in like a real high six poker game. But he, you know, he's, gets, he's famous. He gets invited on TV, and then he gets to play in these like really soft games where actually he's he's good when he's playing against you know um, just like Jimmy Fallon or something, right? Then okay, right. now he's now he is the shark at that table. Mm -hmm. um, so in in um, most poker players don't have that experience. Most poker players, they don't want to be known. But in, in crypto venture, or in venture generally, you want to be known. You want everyone to know that you're really valuable and that you're a person they want to work with. Uh, and that extends not only to just random folks who might someday become entrepreneurs. Uh, it also applies to your portfolio. You want your portfolio to speak highly of you, and you want them to be a strong reference when other people ask around about, how, hey, what is it like to work with this VC? Um, you also want to have strong relationships with co-investors. So other people who you're going to find in around, and you, you want them to say like, hey, I've got this company, um, you know, I don't want to take the whole thing myself. Who do I want to partner with to take down this investment? Um, you know, I want, to, you, want, you want them to think of us. Um, or alternatively, when, um, when we, we know a lot of angels who find deals very early, we want them to say when they meet with a company, hey, you should really take Dragonfly's money because they're a really great uh, investor. And so a lot of our deal flow comes from the relationships that we have and the people with whom we've been valuable, the, the sort of eye scratch uh, your back, you scratch my back. You know, we bring a lot of angels into rounds. They bring us into rounds. We bring a lot of co-investors into our rounds. They bring us into their rounds. And those relationships are 
incredibly valuable over the long run to establishing your deal flow and your access as a VC. Um, and that's the kind of thing you don't deal with when you're when you're a trader or a uh, a poker player. There, there was a meme going around in crypto Twitter not too long ago. Of um, it was from from the perspective of a venture capital uh, fund, and it was like when the portfolio company finally calls you up for that value add that you promised at the very <laughs> beginning of the relationship, and then it was like you know some like small little girl like crying her eyes out, like being boohoo, like oh I have to actually add value. Yeah. What what does adding value actually look like? And then like what are the how how what would one add value to one of their portfolio companies. And I'm assuming that being one of the most viable paths toward establishing reputation, positive reputation for the, for the, for the venture capital fund. Yeah, so there's a few avenues of, of value that are most common. So the first, and th there's a bunch of stuff that's really easy to do that mm -hmm. a lot of VC, no matter how large, would be able to do it. So one example is helping with recruiting, right? So um, you know, helping them find candidates, helping them closing candidates, helping them uh, just even strategize around a hiring strategy, which tends to be one of the biggest difficulties for early stage startups. Um, you know, support on just kind of rote things like legal um, compliance, like figuring out where to structure, uh, given how complex structuring tends to be for crypto projects. So those are some of the very early and obvious needs that early stage startups have. Uh, and then you can even go further afield, sort of more, um, you know, crypto native considerations. So, you know, a lot of people need help with getting an audit. So, you know, these auditors, they tend to have very, very long um, uh, backlogs of audits. And if you can help them accelerate getting into getting an audit more quickly, that's really valuable. Um, there are a lot of service providers like, you know, what's a good accounting firm? What's a good legal firm? What's a good, um, you know, what's a good PR firm if that's what I, if that's what I need? Um, or even, you know, if there's a dev consulting shop that I might need access to, right? Um, then you've got things like, okay, can, can I help you place a story in PR? Can I help you get an announcement into the block or into CoinDesk or into you know one of these crypto native publications where with whom you know we have relationships? Um, and then you start getting even more specialized, which is can you help me with my token economics? Can you help me with my strategy? Can you help me with my go-to-market? Um, and these are places where it's not just enough to have people on staff who are you know good at those individual tasks. That's a place where you really need um, you know sort of investor level expertise. Right. So like, you know, someone like myself or someone like Tom, you know, who's another partner at Dragonfly who used to be head of product at Zero X, you know, folks like us who've seen a ton of projects because of our work and experience in the industry that we can actually sit down with our companies and help them think through, you know, a novel token economic design or a novel approach to mechanism design or, um, you know, some way to uh, structure their token distribution that really requires um, the kind of expertise that they can't buy. Right. You can buy help from a recruiting firm. Like technically we kind of bundle it together with our investment. Um, you can you can buy a PR firm that can you know give you access to a coin desk or whatever, but you can't buy the kind of expertise that a, a relatively small number of firms actually have in-house. Um, you know, it's like for Paradigm, you can't buy Dan Robinson, right? You know, a Dragonfly, like you can't buy a seed to sit down with you and think through your token economics. Um, and so that tends to be the most irreplaceable part of what uh, strong VCs can can provide to portfolio companies. It seems like you um that what if, from what you just listed off, uh, more or less is somehow involved with almost everything about like a startup, just like, you know, legal or just like the Rob token and economics of like how their project works or connections and hiring. It sounds like, you know, you can have, you have the potential of helping them out with almost literally every one of their needs. And a lot of that comes from simply like the reputation and the connections that you've established from yourself as a brand. Like, well, it's easier for us to, to provide that for you than it is for you to provide that for you because we have connections. Is, is that more or less right? Yes and no. I mean, the the, the median company is not going to add, add, ask for even, you know, half of those things, right? Like oh, really? the median company has some of those things figured out and other ones of those they need help on. So, right, yeah, you know, I'm not, wasn't we're not going like, to go back bringing... and like, redo your structuring, right? I wasn't right. saying like you come right. and bring yeah, down exactly. like literally exactly. half of the company coming from Dragonfly to make this one startup, but just like you have the potential to. And you have the optionality to do yes. all of those things. Yes, yes. So I think for sufficiently large firms, we tend to be pretty full stack in the way that we mm -hmm. um, can can perform our value add. Um, but there are some things that are more common than others that people actually want from us, right? Um, generally, what I the advice that I give to founders in thinking about value add is, um, you know, VCs we're in the bundling business, meaning that um, our job is to try to brand our capital as being different from other people's capital. And the reality, of course, that capital is not branded, right? Real, actually, capital is just like money in your bank and you can't tell who it came from. So it doesn't really matter who you get it from. Mm -hmm. um, and so what VCs really do is they try to make it so that the package mm -hmm. 
of my capital is worth more than the package of that person's capital. And um, it's, our, it's in our incentive to bundle as many things as possible in that package. Um, now, the most valuable bundles are bundles that include things that you can't buy otherwise. Right. And so, you know, if, if I were to tell you, like, look, I'm going to invest in your company in exchange, I'm going to market make your token. Um, and that's going to be really valuable. And, you know, so a lot of market makers try to get into uh, VC by offering, you know, a bundle of market making services or, you know, uh, an auditing firm might say, Hey, I, I want to get some room on your cap table. Um, and I will, you know, give you a discount on audits if you, if you use me as an auditor. Um, mm -hmm. and these things are obviously valuable, right? Like it's them trying to compete in their own way in the bundling business. Um, but the advice I generally give founders is that, um, Usually the most valuable bundles, like if you take money from an Andreessen or a Paradigm or a Polychain or a Dragonfly, the most valuable part of that bundle, again, is the part that you cannot buy, mm -hmm. right? So like if, if, uh, if, if somebody wants to offer you market making services, well, it's like you can buy market making services, right? There's a, it's a completely commodified market. You can, you can right. buy it from any of the market makers. They all right. quote your price. Um, but there's some things that, again, you cannot buy or that if you want to try to get yourself will take you a lot of time. And time is the one resource that you cannot spend money on generally. Right. Um, and so those are the things that are usually most valuable in that bundle. And it's why you see, in fact, that, you know, it is the top VCs who end up usually winning the allocation in a lot of these deals, not market makers, not service providers, and not other people who have more commodified forms of that bundle when they're trying to invest into early stage companies. And how does that change the game for what a VC is looking for when it's trying to grow out its own staffing and its own, its own resources in-house? Like what, what, what is hot, what's, what's hot on the market for a VC firm? Is it what's poker players? Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously poker players, very high demand. <laughs> I mean, the, the hardest thing right now that I think most people are realizing is very, very hard to just get an investment team. Mm -hmm. Anybody who knows how to invest in crypto is in extremely high demand. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got, you know, you've got like, you know, 23 year olds who've got like two years of experience who are getting partner offers at like TradFi funds. And this is just this is just the way of the world now, and I, I think it's going to be a while until you see supply and demand equilibrate uh, on the investment side. I mean, you're seeing it too, obviously, on the engineering side, where you're getting seen crazy, crazy engineering hires, crazy legal hires, um, where folks who are making, you know, somebody in big law, for example, who's making you know maybe 500k a year with um, you know four or five years experience at a big law firm, um, is being offered like a million dollars a year in a top token project. Uh, that kind of pay bump is a function of supply and demand, right? There's just not enough supply of crypto native talent. Um, so I think over time that will normalize. Like we're already, you know, you and I are seeing a huge influx of people coming into crypto and those people within a couple of years are going to be ramped up and, and that's going to change the supply and demand mechanics within crypto. Um, but it's going to take some time for that to happen. And we're certainly uh, far away from there today. You said people who know how to invest in crypto. Um, I mean, Anyone who comes into this market can, you know, sign up for Coinbase, buy some ETH and Bitcoin, you know, make it self, uh, take self custody of it, buy some tokens on Uniswap. But what does it really mean to be like good at investing in crypto? Like I've been in this industry for almost five years now, which is insane. Like I'm not even sure if I'm good at investing in crypto. So like, what does that actually mean? So when I say investing, I mean, the liquid market side, I have less expertise on just because it's not what I spend my day to day on. Sure. Um, the, the venture side, what it means to be good at investing into crypto, generally the way that you're going to be measured for your skill at investing is, um, one, is just your portfolio. Right? So what, what deals have you gotten into? So whether that's as an angel or whether that's at a firm where you're investing uh, you know, on behalf of a, of a, of a platform. Um, but then th there's, there's one element of getting a check into a deal, which is kind of just your, it's, it's really about judgment and having some degree of access. But the real barometer of like how good are you investing in crypto is, uh, can you lead deals? Can you really extract large amounts of the cap table and really sell an entrepreneur on not just let me in the round, but have me be the guy who you partner with for this round? Um, and that is, you know, it's, it's sort of like if you, if you got into a great deal, like let's say you did, um, let's say you did Avalanche early, right? Um, you get some points for just picking Avalanche. So it's like, okay, great. You have good judgment. You have good taste in deals. Um, you get, even more points if you got a if you're more than just an angel, but you got a platform into Avalanche, right? Because as an angel, it's all right. You get like a 25k check in. Okay, that's like not that hard to get a 25k check in. People will take a 25k check, you know, even if you just have a vague promise of being valuable. Um, but if you want to get like a 500k check in or a 200k check in, it's like okay, you need to really justify that for a platform. Um, so that gives you more points. But the most points you'll get is if you get like you know a, a three million dollar check in or a 10 million dollar check in. That's like okay, you 
you really earned the trust of this person and you can win deals. And winning deals is kind of the, the hardest and rarest skill to get in crypto. And, and, and the reason why, of course, is that that's a very multidimensional skill. Uh, in order to win a deal, you need to be competent, you need to be trustworthy, you need to have uh, relationships that are really strong, you need to have a reputation of value add. It's like all those things that we were talking about, you need to, you need to kind of be the whole package in order to be able to lead deals. And so that's like the highest echelon of, okay, you are somebody around whom we can build a firm because you're a deal winner. Um, so th those are the, the ways in which if I were looking at a potential investment candidate, that's how I'd be sizing up the, the value of their, of their experience. Um, so the, the worst of all is if like, if you're somebody who you've, you, you have a track record of investments into terrible deals, then it's like, okay, I, I like would rather not work with you at all because like you're going to be bringing in bad deals and you don't have a good reputation and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So they need, they need their own deal flow. They obviously need their own capital, but from what I heard is like the real magic is, um, <laughs> allocating size into a good a deal that ultimately ends up working out. And so basically having the conviction and the knowledge to, um, you know, quote unquote, ape into a very strong deal that turns out to be strong in hindsight. That's really what you're looking for. Right. But also the, the ability to, to win that lead position in a round. Right. Yes. Winning a lead position is, is a lot of it is really about sales. Right. Um, and it's about sales and marketing, right? So I, the, the way I like to put it is that um, as a VC firm, you have to do both. You have to do both sales and marketing. Marketing is brand. Marketing is like the research you put out, the talks you give, the, the tweets you do, like the, the way in which people know who you are before you show up to the table. That's marketing. Um, that's your brand. But your ability to win deals, like when you actually show up and sit down with an entrepreneur and convince them, yo, you should let me lead you around because I'm awesome and I'm going to you know, help you become successful. Um, that's sales. That's more like hand-to-hand -hand combat. And um, in order to be a great VC, you need to be able to do both. You need to be able to do both building the brand and the reputation of yourself and your firm, but you also need to be able to sit down with an entrepreneur and convince them that you're the guy. They should take you over Polychain or Andreessen or over Paradigm. Um, and that's, and that's hard. It's hard to do. Um, but the very best investors uh, have exactly that skill set. Am I allowed to ask what your pitch is or is that trade secrets? <laughs> um, you're allowed to ask. It depends a lot on the company, what mm -hmm. um, the sales pitch is. But um, if I just sort of uh, imagine myself pitching a generic company, I'd say there, there are a few things that I would lean on in my pitch. So um, assuming it's me, my, myself personally, who's the partner who's, who's on that deal, um, the first thing I'd point out is that, you know, I've invested in, you know, a bunch of the great companies and products in crypto. Um, so, you know, I did the seed round of Avalanche, seed round of Near Protocol, seed round of, uh, you know, Dune Analytics, um, uh, Matter Labs, uh, a bunch of the great company and, you know, Compound and MakerDAO and One Inch and so on. So a bunch of stuff, whether it's in CFI, DeFi, layer ones, layer twos, um, I've been an early investor in, in, in all those things. So I know the industry extremely well. Um, I, I think very deeply and strongly about token economics. It's something I could sit down with you on and help you think through um, how to design your protocol and what are the pitfalls that I've seen other projects fall into that, um, that you can avoid. Um, I have relationships with you know, all the big folks in the space, whether it's auditors, um, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the, the PR firms or sorry, not PR firms, the, uh, the, uh, publications that, um, uh, that you want to get your story out into. Um, and, um, and I'm somebody you want in your corner, you know, I'm somebody who can help you think through the ups and downs of like how to build this thing from zero to hundred. Um, and then of course, the other thing about Dragonfly that makes us very unique is that, uh, we're also a global firm. So we have a presence in Asia, which most of the firms don't really have. Um, and we can help you think about how to bring your protocol or your company to a global stage beyond just the Twitter sphere. Um, Twitter is huge, obviously. Crypto Twitter is a big deal, but it's only one part of where crypto operates. And crypto is a global phenomenon. And if you don't have a window into your community outside of the US or outside of the Anglophone market, um, then you're missing a big part of what's making your protocol tick. Um, and that's something that I can help you navigate. So that's my very generic, <laughs> that's my very generic pitch. Um, but you know, usually it depends on who I'm sitting down in front of, uh, mm -hmm. what in particular I would be focused on in, uh, communicating why I'm the right person to partner with. Yeah. After you establish like relationships with these companies, like I'm sure they, they turn into, you know, more than just, you know, your portfolio companies. I'm sure like you get to know these people, get to know their face, you establish some sort of like actual relationship with them. How, how do you go about navigating the actual selling of the asset, selling of the token? Because you know, th there are some brands, there are some VC funds out there 
that have the explicit brand of like this fund dumps your token at the soonest available opportunity. And that's kind of definitely worked against them. So obviously that's something that you have to consider as a VC is like with the timing and just like, uh, you know, obviously like your job is to make money. So the commitment is like, well, at some point the token gets sold. But like also that is like a a choice of like, oh yeah, we are choosing to uh, kind of transactionally end our relationship by selling this token, not all of it, but how, how do you navigate those waters of like, this is an appropriate time to credibly and honorably sell this token? Like, how, how do you time that? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a good, and it's a very tricky question. Um, so there's a few components of it. So the first, of course, is that, uh, you know, as VCs, we're always locked up in every investment that we make. We, do, we don't do any deals without lockups. Um, so the, there's a, and generally speaking, you know, when we're looking at a deal and there's not the pretense of lockups, um, or, you know, there's like, okay, everyone is going to be fully unlocked in like a year and a half. Generally speaking, that's like a hard pass from us because um, we believe really strongly in the alignment of incentives. And, you know, we, we saw this in the, you know, 2017, 2018 ICO boom is that when you don't have lockups, you don't have incentives aligned, then people basically, they launch something and then they walk away. Oh, well, um, page, and we believe yeah. that's not, it's not healthy for the community. Yeah, exactly. It's not healthy for the community. It's not healthy for the uh, investors. It's not healthy for the founders. So, um, so generally, we, we, we in general push for lockups and we like lockups. Um, and we, and we often prefer them to be longer than what sometimes, uh, uh, some of the, uh, initial state in which we, we might find these rounds, um, being, being priced at. Uh, now that being said, like obviously as a venture capitalist, we, we eventually have to sell because we have LPs and our LPs have the demand to, to eventually get their money back. So we do eventually have to sell, but we're in no hurry to sell, right? So as venture capitalists, we're not traders, um, and we're under, there, there's no reason why we have to sell the moment that our lockup expires. Um, and so generally speaking, we don't sell when our lockup expires. And um, the and our view also is that, you know, most of the money in the space is made in the long run. Um, like there, there's always money that you can make by, um, you know, flipping things quickly, you know, buying things early and then selling them as soon as they become liquid on the market. There's some folks who engage in that strategy and it, it, it's a strategy that can work. Um, sometimes it doesn't work, but a lot of times it does work. Um, but that's not how... That's not how the big money gets made. The big money gets made by finding the right things and, and sticking to them and, and betting them as they continue to grow and becoming extremely valuable, right? Like the way that you got rich off Ether and Bitcoin was not by jumping in and out of the market when you know, things were good and things were bad. Like, there, there are people who made money doing that, absolutely. A lot of people made a lot of money in crypto. Um, but the people who made the most money in crypto are the people who just sat there and held the most valuable things. Mm-hmm. And as a VC, again, we think in terms of power laws. And if you think in terms of power laws, you realize like, look, it's possible that, you know, some of the stuff that we invest in, it goes liquid. And as it goes liquid, it, it you know, the, the, the demand doesn't keep pace with supply, the, you know, supply keeps going out of the market and the thing, the price just, you know, slowly, slowly creeps down and you end up, you know, losing a lot of what initially looked like your markup uh, might have been. Um, this definitely happens and it's happened to us in our portfolio a bunch of times and it's, it's very normal. Um, but it doesn't really matter that much in the context of our overall portfolio compared to the things that are really going to work, right? So it's like the layer ones that you bet on that didn't take off, all of them got more than paid for by the avalanches of the world, the nears of the world that really did take off and really became extremely valuable. And so in the overall picture of a portfolio, it just doesn't really matter whether or not you like sold this thing early or sold it late. Like it, 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 it doesn't matter relative to the overall growth of, of crypto and the most valuable things that are being, being built. And that's why, one, we don't lose too much sleep over whether we timed this particular thing or not. Um, and second, why we're not under a strong impetus to sell things quickly, right? So if we end up being wrong in certain number of the bets that we made, then okay, we'll take the L. It's unfortunate we didn't get what we, you know, might have originally hoped to have gotten in this particular investment. Um, but we don't try to immediately dump the tokens as we get them because it's just not necessary. Now that doesn't mean that we never sell things, you know, before 10 years or something. We do, we do sometimes sell things before some other period because of some fundamental view or we might have lost you might have fundamentally lost confidence in a particular project or particular position, in which case we will do that. But if we, if we're, if we're still along for the ride and we believe in the entrepreneur, then we'll, we'll hold and we'll, we'll wait to see what this thing evolves into. Because again, you know, the thing about crypto is that crypto is very cyclical. And, um, you know, there are times when the market goes into, you know, a secular decline and, you know, we talk about narrative exhaustion, it happens in crypto. Um, but, you know, the cyclicality of crypto also means that at some point again, people get excited and it starts to go up and, and those things, uh, you know, the animal spirits, return. Um, and so to some degree, like you don't need to over-index on what's going on in the market right now. Um, almost always the right answer in retrospect was just keep holding and see what happens with the market. And probably that would have ended up working out better for you. 
But how does that work when so much of crypto operates in fads, right? Like if you, the, the advice of just like, well, you can kind of just hold your way through it definitely doesn't always work. So like take, take for example, of somebody who gets into the world of the ICO mania, like you can't really hold your way through the ICO mania. Granted, there are things like SNX and uh, Lend, which then turned into Aave and Link, right? Like we got three big, big winners coming out of the ICO mania. Oh no, we got more than that. We got a lot more than that. Really? Right? Like uh, what, what were the other ICOs? Cosmos? ICP, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, def- uh, uh, um, uh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? Um, Polkadot, Polkadot, I guess, was also one. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. There, exactly. There were a ton of huge winners in the ICO boom, right? If you, it's it is very reminiscent of the dot com bubble. Is I that the dot com so. bubble yeah. included Amazon? It included Google. It included a ton of companies that ended yeah. up becoming absolutely generational winners. And so, if you just bought a basket, a lot of things in that basket would have gone to zero, and then you would have had some things that paid for everything. Right. right, and today it looks like that's Cosmos, Definity, you know, uh, 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 Polkadot, um, and a number of other projects that have become tremendously successful that were part of that ICO boom. Yeah, I guess I guess I might have revealed my 2017 investor naivete because I was definitely <laughs> definitely buying Substratum and a bunch of other just like you know shit coins right. <laughs> all right. throughout 2017 because I didn't yeah. know. Yeah, so like doing. look, some things got absolutely wrecked, right? Some things yeah. got absolutely wrecked and are just lost to history. But there were a lot of things that ended up becoming among the most valuable protocols in existence. Mm-hmm. So, so on the whole, I bet you that if you index the ICO bubble, you made money. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you, you talked about how like three three W's will pay for the fund, and then one one W will be like the mm. the one thousand X that like really really is a differentiator. Has there ever been like a a time where you've been listening to a pitch, or you just kind of been reflecting or diving diving deep on a on a on a on a project, and you're like, it's going to be that one? Like, did you? Is there ever a time where you identified it ahead of time? Uh Where I identified it correctly ahead of time. Yes, correctly ahead um, of time, or at least you know ballpark. Correctly ballpark. ahead of time. Yeah, um, I think the only time that I have done that was near. I yeah. think near is the only one that I like. I saw that and I was like, I know that this one is going to hit. I know that this one is going to be huge. Um, and that was only in the Series A, not in the Seed. In the Seed, I, 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 it was very, very uh, nebulous. But in the Series A, uh, which was pre-token launch. Um, I was like, this one is going to be absolutely massive. Um, that was probably the only one that I identified. Oh, no, the th- second one I'd say was Bybit. Bybit was the other one that um, we bet on. And we were like, this thing is going to be absolutely a massive success. Um, but most of the time, uh, it was a surprise. Do, do, was there anything you remember that really stuck out as to like, was just like pure product market fit? Or like anything that stuck out that really was like, well, this is this is why I believe in this. For near, I say for Bybit, it was more straightforward. It's just that these guys were just growing like crazy. They had super good execution. They had super high margins, and um, they were basically coming into the market right as Bitmex was falling off, and so they were filling a big hole in the market um, and in the derivative space. So that was just like a market structure, and it was just really obvious to anybody who had underwritten the business that these guys were just going to continue to crush. And of course, perps are just a huge market, so being one of the dominant players in purpose and rapidly rising in your market share. Um, it's, you know, I, I feel like it, that, that was just a hundred IQ, like doesn't require a lot of insight to realize that Bybit was going to win. Um, to look at near the reason why we, I was so bullish on near at that time, this was like, um, uh, before the, um, the coinless sale that we invested into near. And the reason why I was so bullish on near at that time was one is that I felt like near was, probably pound for pound, the best engineering team in crypto, uh, in layer ones. Um, second is that they had basically innovated on the design for Ethereum 2.0. Like Ethereum 2.0 actually took a lot from the near sharding design. There was a lot of, um, I feel like the two things that were most influential on on uh, uh, ETH 2.0 were probably near and Falcoin, uh, were probably the two biggest influences. And um, and near just had the most credible shot on sharding of any blockchain that I'd seen. Um, and that seemed really, really compelling. Um, and third is that they had an EVM story and I was, you know, very bullish on the EVM, uh, continuing to be dominant. And if they could integrate the EVM into a sharding based platform, but also with the de- developer experience of having a WASM based runtime that people could also opt into that was higher performance, that I was just like, this thing is just going to be huge given that the demand for ether, uh, the demand for Ethereum block space is so high. 
Um, and I think sharding is just long term the most um, the most credible path to scaling. So, um, or not the most, but one, one of the most credible paths to scaling. So um, that made me just incredibly bullish on here. Do you know when this was? When was this? Um, this was uh, late 2020. So okay. this was like um, October-ish, I think. Yeah, it's, October, demand space for Ethereum hadn't, it had started to pick up. We were at one GUI gas prices for a really long time. And I can't remember when we actually broke right. out of that paradigm and went from like one to three. And then a few months later, we went three to 10. And everyone was like freaking out right. about how congested Ethereum block space was. <laughs> I think that was towards the end of 2019. Um, but you, you must have yeah, been well, this is this is after DeFi demand. summer. Oh. Well, this was after DeFi summer. But yes, like it was uh, block, okay. block was demand. Off. So 2020 was DeFi summer. Yeah, yeah, 2020 was DeFi summer. Sorry, so, um, sorry. I, was, I, thought, I thought I heard you say 2019. Yeah, okay. Well, no, then no, that no, case no, 2020. Not obvious. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was pretty straightforward that yeah. uh, demand for block space exceeded what Ethereum was going to be able to do. And the other thing, of course, was just that uh, Ethereum 2.0 was so far away. And right. it was just really obvious to us that, like, everybody who was thinking Ethereum 2.0 was coming soon was right. completely off the rocker. And, like, it was going to take forever for Ethereum 2.0. So you needed to have other approaches to scaling blockchains to come in the interim. So like um, at that time, there was this debate that I feel like, um, in my mind, got resolved in early 2020 of, is it going to be Ethereum and Ethereum 2.0, or is it going to be alternative layer ones? And to me, like, it just became, I just was, became absolutely certain, basically, in, um, in like, early, mid, late 2018, it was not obvious to me. I feel like it really could have gone either way. Um, early 2019, it felt like the other way. Mid to late 2019, I became more and more certain that other layer ones were going to matter and that Ethereum was not just going to own the entire market. Um, mm -hmm. And then by, by late 2020, I feel like it was just a done deal. Mm -hmm. And what do you think now? I, I, I think it, it's, it's been the same since 2020. It's a done yeah, deal. Has not There's going, we're, we're in a multi-chain world, right? There's no longer a debate. Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. Do you th what do you think over like 2025 to 2030, the distribution between market share between Ethereum and the rest of the, uh, the alt layer ones. Do you have a kind of a gut ballpark field on, on what that, what that might look like? Mm. Um, I, it's, it's an extremely hard question. Um, if I just had to give a guess off the top of my head, I would guess that Ethereum is probably going to have like 50 to 60% market share. Mm -hmm. And then, and then like three to five all layer ones split up the rest. Something like that, yeah. My guess is that like the number two player probably has twenty percent market share, and then it like kind of falls off from there. Sure. Living a bankless life requires taking control over your own private keys, and that's why so many in the bankless nation already have their Ledger hardware wallet. And brand new to the Ledger lineup of hardware wallets is the Ledger Nano S Plus, a huge upgrade to the world's most popular hardware wallet. With more memory and a larger screen, the Nano S Plus makes it easy to navigate and verify your transactions. And the paired Ledger Live desktop app gives you increased transparency as to what is about to happen with your NFT. What you see is what you sign. The Nano S Plus gives you the smoothest possible user experience while you're doing all of your crypto things. So go to the Ledger website to check out the features of the new Ledger Nano S Plus and join the waitlist to get yours. And don't forget about the Crypto Life card, also powered by Ledger. The CL card is a crypto debit card that hooks right into the Ledger Live app, right next to all the DeFi apps and services that you're already used to doing, like swapping tokens and staking. So if you don't have a Ledger hardware wallet, go to ledger.com, grab a Ledger, and take control over your crypto. So, you've got some money, but how are you going to use it? You want to spend. You, me, shopping, now, bro. When you know you should be saving. You'll never buy a house at this rate. But what if you could spend and save at the same time? For the enlightened kind, with inquiring minds, a new world awaits. Set yourself free with completely flexible, self-repaying loan technology. Supported on desktop and mobile, seize the power of Alchemix, allowing you to spend and save at the same time. Leverage your wealth without risk of liquidation. Take out a loan that repays itself. By using yield from your deposit to pay off your balance, your only debt is time. What was once inconceivable is now within your grasp. You're winning some. Polygon is Ethereum's largest and most vibrant scaling solution to date. 
With millions of monthly users and all of the biggest DeFi apps, the Polygon ecosystem has turned into a blossoming metropolis of DeFi activity. Transactions on Polygon are quick and cheap, allowing users the freedom to achieve their DeFi goals, all while being economically anchored to Ethereum. But Polygon isn't just the proof of stake sidechain. The Polygon team is building a suite of scaling solutions, including Polygon Hermes, Maiden, Nightfall, and Zero, all with different design choices in order to be optimized for all possible crypto use cases. If you're a developer who wants to build on the Polygon ecosystem, go to the link in the show notes to check out their fantastic documentation. And if you're a user who just wants to experience fast and cheap DeFi, you can bridge over your ETH or other tokens and start playing around with any of the thousands of applications that are available on Polygon. Switching gears a little bit here, I remember uh, going back to kind of the similar question where like you had this opportunity and you knew ahead of time that this was going to work. Um, for me in 2018, mm. that was Cosmos. Um, I learned about <laughs> Cosmos doing just like basic, like very like 2018 was my first like nine months into crypto. So I was very, very new, but I still had like my strong intuition that I think most people didn't have back then. And uh, the, the multi-chain the, and like interoperability layer is very, very attractive uh, it's like a very simple concept. Oh, we got all these chains. Well, we need the chains to span the chains. Gauss Cosmos. Like, obviously, we, we, need, we, we need that. And I remember I was working at an ICO advisory company, my first crypto job. Uh, and I went and printed off, like, the first couple pages of the Cosmos white paper. And I took it over to the research team. I slapped it down on the desk. And I was like, guys, read this. Uh, and I was like, they were all like, oh, my God, this is so great. This is exactly what we're looking for. Um, uh, so basically, the, the TLDR of the story is like, I had, I had that, like I, I, I called that, but after I was like, okay, like how do I buy the token? Uh, it turns out like they had already sold the token to, uh, I'm pretty sure accredited investors that I was not able to, to get in at the time. Cause I was like a, a, a recently broke college student. And so we're, we've had this conversation about like VCs and their connections to, to media mm -hmm. firms and to, and to, uh, like, um, uh, token, uh, or smart contract auditors and being able to, uh, provide value to their, to their angel or the, to their seed investment companies or portfolio companies by using their connections. Uh, and like, you know, we still have accreditation laws and all that stuff. And, and to some degree, part of the web three narrative is like, we can get away from all that. Like we can have like the right. users and that was the ICO narrative is that, you know, it's no, it's the users that are the investors now. Do you still see any like kernel of energy around that narrative in, in, in web three? Cause I, I see it less and less and less these days. Yeah. Well, first of all, didn't Cosmos do an ICO? Yeah. It might've just been bef before my time. So I might've just missed it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, Cause I'm pretty sure they did. I'm pretty sure they did. The story is still the but same. Yes. But I understand that. I understand the broader point. <laughs> I understand the broader point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is that uh, when we say retail, mm -hmm. what do we mean by retail? Um, because the, the, the reality, and, and what do we mean by the community, right? Those are often the two sure. terms that we kind of use right. interchangeably, but I think they also imply different things. Sure. Um, the reality of course, is that you look at DeFi, right? When you, when you open up something like when you open up an IDO, the, the vision behind opening up an IDO or opening up like NFT minting is that the community or retail gets to participate, right? right. Um, and the reality, of course, is that it's not retail or quote unquote the community that participates. It's a bunch of trading firms with bots that actually can, you know, get, get into get into flash bots or, or, you know, front run the mempool or do all this fancy stuff to go and fill out this entire thing before you can even show up, right? If you're, if you're sitting there clicking buttons on an interface, like right. you're already out of the game. Like that's, right. you're, you're, you're done. Like they're, don't even bother. Um, so the ability to really identify what do we mean by retail has become more and more clouded over time as the space has gotten more professionalized. So that's, that's one thing. Now, the second thing is that, uh, in some ways, kind of one of the most pure embodiments of what we mean by retail and the community is, um, uh, what's, what's, what's the term called? like discord grinding, uh, or, mm -hmm. uh, whitelist mm -hmm. grinding yeah. basically mm -hmm. like, you know, folks who basically will just go around and like basically farm engagement right. in a bunch of different right. discords in order to get farm, invited farm to participation, you know, yeah. pre-mint. Exactly. Farm participation. Right. And like, in a way, this is actually very, um, this is like, these are true retail people who are doing this, right? Like this is not, uh, trading firms that are going in and doing it because you can't do that at scale. Right. This is like mm -hmm. true individuals, but of course it's the most cavalier mercenary kinds of individuals who are going in and doing that. Uh, the real thing that you want, what you mean when you say, how do we get the participation of retail is what I mean is like the really nice folks who are not trying to game things, who are not just in it for the money, who really just believe in the ethos of Ethereum or believe in the ethos of NFTs or believe in the ethos of the thing that I'm building. And the reality is that like 
as you start slicing up the pie of what I mean by retail, um, it starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where like it's almost impossible to actually specify those people within a set of rules, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of like I know it when I see it, when I know like a real genuine community member, but there's no mechanism I can come up with that actually distributes tokens to just those people and not these other people who I don't want to give tokens to because they're all a bunch of mercenaries. And I think the realization that as the space is professionalized, it's harder and harder to accomplish that true goal, which is, you know, I want to give it to my true community members, um, that you realize like, look, the, the ROI on giving it to the folks who show up in whatever mechanism I come up with, if 80% of those tokens are actually going to trading firms, then like that's such terrible ROI on, on, on trying to do a community distribution that like, why am I even optimizing for that anymore? It's so inefficient to try to do that, that it just doesn't work. Now we have things like, you know, ArcX um, or things like Galaxy that uh, try to find ways to sort of do on-chain KYC for real good users who've been, you know, active in governance or who have participated in other DeFi protocols before as a, as a kind of civil resistance for, you know, how to identify really true good community members. Uh, but the reality is that it's hard. It's really hard to do that. Um, and so one of the reasons why people kind of throw up their arms and give up on this notion of, you know, really being, really trying to do an earnest distribution to community is that the definition and the ability to access that community has changed over the last three or four years, right? Four years ago, it was much easier. If you did an ICO, you could pretty much bet that most people who are buying your token were genuinely quote unquote retail or quote unquote community members. Uh, but that's just not true today. And that's why it's a lot easier to say, look, I know if I give my money or sorry, if I, if I take capital from a, you know, high quality VC that they will help me. But I don't know if I, if I do a distribution to quote unquote retail, that it's not going to mostly go to a bunch of trading firms that are just going to dump my token the moment they pick it up, which is in fact what will happen if you just do an IDO um, without any other forms of gating. So that I think is, is where a lot of this exasperation with the notion of selling tokens to community has come from. Yeah, it seems like a gigantic uh, Moloch trap where even if there are a supply of very engaged quality community members who definitely deserve uh, the tokens, like the more and more of those people that there are, the more and more incentive it, it becomes to game game those the, that existence of those people and like become the wolf in the sheep's clothing. Like, oh yeah, we're just like those. Let us in, and then we'll just drown everyone out. Exactly, and that's and you see the same thing with like you know you saw it with ribbon farming. You see it with you know DYDX. Um, you know watch trading. You see it with almost every one of these mechanics uh, for distributing tokens to users of the protocol gets gamed right. in one way or another. Right. Um, and there's almost no mechanism you can come up with that will not get gamed somehow. So say that there, that every single uh, cycle of crypto brings in their brand new cohort. Like we currently have the 2020 to 2021 cohort of crypto people who are, you know, quote unquote, buying the top and like earning their stripes and all that stuff. But say there's a listener who right. uh, is like, well, I'm one of those, like, I believe in crypto. I believe in the ethos. I see the the potential of crypto, not just for 2025 or 2023 or 2030, but like for 2050 and 2070. And I'm, I'm so crypto pilled and I, I believe in the ethos and I'm here for the long term, and I am a good community member. There's a, I hope there's a, a number of those listeners listening to Bankless right now. Do you have any just perspectives or thoughts or advice for, for these types of people? It's just how to navigate the murky waters of retail and actually become elevated to start participating in some of the conversations that, that we've been having here. Yeah, I, I'd say the, um, the number one thing that you can do in anything, but especially in crypto, is to take on responsibility. Hmm. So the one thing that there is, there's a lot of engagement in crypto, right? There's a lot of people who'll show up in your Discord, a lot of people who will like, you know, some, especially on your first governance vote, a lot of people who might vote in governance or like weigh in on some forum post. Um, but there are not a lot of people who will take on responsibility, who will raise up their hand and say, I will be responsible for X. And I will do the, you know, the cat herding, I will do the dirty work, I will write up the docs, I will, you know, uh, organize the um, the governance calls or whatever it is, right? Uh, that, that instinct to just raise your hand and take on responsibility in the communities that you're a part of is the most valuable thing. And the most likely thing that's going to, one, get you a lot smarter about Web3. And also, if what you're looking for is compensation as a, you know, member of the Web3 community, um, you're going to get there much faster by taking on that responsibility and also getting invited upwards to take on responsibility in other communities and other DAOs and other multisigs, right? Like if you if you show up in a bunch of these discords and you just, you know, type a bunch of random stuff and get into arguments and then, uh, you know, expect an airdrop, that person is going to become much less successful over the next, you know, several years than the person who learns 
how to be an active and engaged and valuable community member. So that would be my number one piece of advice to, to the marginal person coming into crypto. I think that maps onto a lot of the advice that I've seen other industries give with when it generally comes to like breaking into the industry, like you're a no one and you're in a sea of nobodies. And so how do you stand out is that, well, you start doing valuable work for free. Uh, and if you do work for free, that's like the easiest way to stand out because no one does work for free. Like, why yep. would they do that? Uh, but like doing work for free and, and willingly uh, take on responsibility without everyone, anyone asking you uh, is indicative of, of perhaps so many more things. And that's perhaps why people, uh, why people like that peak the interests of, of others. That's exactly right. And th the number one thing that um, I hear founders lament about you know, their communities is that there are a lot of people who show up because they want an airdrop or they want, you know, to get mm. some alpha or whatever. Um, there are not a lot of people who show up and like, hey, I love what you're doing. How can I get involved? That is like music to every founder's ears. And um, if you just say those magic words, like, how can I help? Uh, they will be absolutely delighted and they will sing your praises from the rooftops and you'll start building your own reputation as being a valuable member of the Web3 community and not just somebody who's here to learn, but somebody who's here to contribute. I will say that the question of how can I help, not 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 from the centralized projects, upstarts and, and startups, but from the DAO side of things, the question of how can I help has become like an absolute meme because everyone in a DAO, in a decentralized DAO, <laughs> wants to ask that question, but no one wants to actually be the delegation of responsibility. And so no one in DAOs, right. no one can actually say like, do this. We need more people in DAOs to say, oh, you want to help? Go do this. We have not enough, not enough people to delegate responsibility and way too many people saying, oh, let me know how I can help. Um, are, are you, are you, do you pay attention to like the, the DAO dynamics? Um, in the DAOs that I'm actively engaged in, I do. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, they're, they're obviously the, the number of DAOs has just massively exploded. Sure. Um, sure. But the thing, the thing that I guess the uh, maybe a more pointed form of advice is like, just go start doing things, right? Like you notice that this thing is a problem and like, don't wait for someone to like deputize you to be the person who goes and does this. Sure. Like there's, there's this debate going on. You're the one who goes in and like creates a, a doc that like summarizes everyone's positions. Or you're the person who goes and like, just is like, okay, man, we don't, we, we're not keeping track of like X, Y, Z and nobody can seem to get an answer on like what has gone on up till now. And so you just go in and you're the documentarian. They're just like, you know, that just solves that problem for everyone. Um, and the more that you start doing that and the more that you start building the trust in the people who are actually in the positions of authority, uh, recognize like the community leaders recognize like, oh, this person is a problem solver. This person, instead of sitting around waiting to be told what to do, does valuable things. Um, then they'll be like, cool, there's some other stuff that we could also use, you know, some extra hands on. You talked about how a lot of founders are frustrated by the number of people in discourse who are just there to like get the airdrop. Uh, and I'm reminded about, I can't remember the name of this phenomenon, but just like when something just becomes the norm, then it becomes gamed, right? Like now everyone's just gaming airdrops. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think like airdrops right. are kind of turning into a thing in the past just because they've just been overused and abused for the last like 18 months? Or do you think airdrops are going to be here for the rest of time? I think airdrops are probably going to be here for a long time. Um, I think there are some projects that will start to avoid doing airdrops, but airdrops are, although they are gamed, they're still really valuable. Um, but there's a, the ability now to forego the airdrop, um, but to benefit from the implication of an airdrop, right? So like, if you don't do an airdrop when you launch your token, people get mad at you. Mm -hmm. Even if you never say you're going to do an airdrop, you know, you don't even imply that you're going to do an airdrop, but like people will automatically get mad at you. So like, what? How could you launch a project without an airdrop? How could you not reward your early customers? This is a terrible project. I'm going to leave a bad review. I'm going to report you or whatever. I'm going to like tell the SEC on you, right? Like this is the kind of comments you'll get if you try to launch mm -hmm. a project without an airdrop. You report the SEC. Why? On why is that the case? <laughs> why is that the case, right? Like, why is that, why is that happening? And the answer I think is that, um, what we have now is this very interesting, um, this very interesting thing that you generally don't see in economics, which is uh, basically like backwards causation in the sense that you are incentivizing behavior people did in the past mm -hmm. by a pre-commitment that you're going to do something in the future to reward their past behavior, right? So it's almost like, you know, um, uh, I'm going to, uh, like, here, here's, here's one problem uh, in, in general, like a, a generalized problem in, in just game theory, right? Like, let's say that uh, I want to make you... Um, 
let's say we're in Russia and I'm like trying to make you uh, become, you know, the next president of Russia. Um, and, you know, becoming the president of Russia is a very cutthroat business, right? So when you become president of Russia, you just have total control over everything. You're just like a, you know, a dictator. Mm -hmm. um, so if I help you to become the president of Russia, but when I, when I succeed in making you president of Russia, I lose all my leverage over you. So I have no way to make you enforce your commitment to actually, you know, pay me back for helping make you the president of Russia. Um, then like, I have no way to stop you from backstabbing me. And it's not rational for you anymore when you become president of Russia for you to actually make good on the commitments you made prior to that, because you know, you can, you have total control. Now you can just like kill everyone who could potentially get in your way or who had any leverage over you. So this is a fundamental problem in a lot of systems where you cannot actually reward people in the past because there's no credible way to enforce the commitment after you, you, you know, become successful, right? In the same way, right? Like how do you enforce when a project actually becomes successful that they are going to go do the airdrop? And the answer is that there is really no way to do it. There's no way to enforce that this DAO actually does the airdrop um, and therefore rewarding the early community. Like the way that you, the leverage they have over you is that they're going to yell at you and they're going to say, this is a bad project and blah, 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 right? But like, if you become OpenSea or if you become, you know, Uniswap, it doesn't really matter what those people say because you're going to win anyway, right? Um, mm -hmm. So somehow we've gotten to this equilibrium that even though it's really hard to enforce this, every project is kind of benefiting from this assumption that the carrot. there is going the to be an airdrop. Carrot. We're not going to say it. We're not going to, there's an invisible carrot, right? That's now implied with almost every single project. And the projects benefit from that because now a lot of people are using the project. They're putting TVL in the project. They're blah, 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 right? Like they're, they're getting the flywheel going in the expectation that there is going to be an airdrop. Now, if you don't do the airdrop, right? Um, if you don't do the airdrop, you're kind of defecting in the prisoner's dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. You're the person who's like, you know what? Everyone else is going to get hurt for this because other people now are going to start assuming that maybe there's not an airdrop on the next marginal project, but it's to my benefit to not do the airdrop, right? Um, even if a few people get mad at me, I don't really care. It's not going to impact my community that much. Um, I suspect that what you'll see though is that the risk of uh, not doing the airdrop and pissing off your community is going to perceive as being too high. That most projects are going to say, look, I'm going to do something even if it's nominal, even if it's a very small airdrop. I'll do something. Um, and that's the way in which I'm going to quote unquote defect from this equilibrium. So I'll do like a two to 3% token distribution airdrop, which is something, but it's not much. Uh, and that'll be my carrot to the community and say, look, I did an airdrop. You guys are just complaining, but technically like I did the airdrop, I never told you how much I was gonna give to the community. Um, and that will become more and more closer to the equilibrium. But I think airdrops will probably just never go away because they are, they've just become the norm and people don't wanna make their community mad at them. Um, and so it's like, I, I, I'm okay with having my community a little bit mad at me, but I really don't want them to be like completely mad at me. And that's why like airdrops will just be this like sticky thing, kind of like white papers were, right? Like white papers, like why, why did we keep writing like LaTeX white papers after Bitcoin, even for things that aren't technical, right? Like they don't need a white paper to explain them. Like after 2017, there became this like cargo cult of if you're launching a token, you need a white paper and you need to put like math equations in it. And right. like we just or still- even you know, worse graphic design. Gradually let go of this. Yes, exactly. Like we've gradually let go of this. We're like now, now you see like notions, right? Like there's like a notion and we've, we've gradually gotten to the point where you don't have to have a white paper anymore, unless you're building something super, super technical, in which case, okay, you still need to have a white paper. Um, but, um, this norm just like showed up and it, it was so hard to make it go away. Even when I would tell on Twitter, look, I don't care. You don't need to have a white paper. Just explain what you're building clearly. That's all I ask for. I do not ask for a white paper. I don't want a white paper. I want a clear explanation of what you're building. Um, but uh, it took a long time for it to go away because a lot of these norms become really sticky and hard to uh, hard to dismantle. And I think airdrops might be one of them. Yeah, right. Um, it is such a useful primitive that you, it, it seems like people with enough creativity would be able to derive some sort of value out of them because you can kind of custom custom design an airdrop however you, like it's like, like it's almost like Turing complete, right? Like you can kind of design an airdrop however you see right. fit. So it's really up to you to, to, to make it work. Um, Hasib, as we, as we kind of wrap up here, I have a, just a zoomed out higher level question for you. Do you think Web3 yeah. is currently, or at least on the trajectory towards trying to kind of fulfill some of the, from the, some of the goals that the crypto industry has for it? It's like Web3 has an ethos, it has like a vision, uh, or are you, or are we not doing that? Or are you more agnostic to like people's subjective interpretations as to what Web three should be? Does that make sense as, as a question? 
It does, it does. Um, I would say I am personally more agnostic about what Web3 is and what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the term Web3 has metamorphosed so much over the last few years, right? Like Web3, um, you know, originally we just called it crypto. Now Web3 kind of is like this big basket of things that I mm -hmm. a lot. When I think Web3, you know, wh what that originally meant to me was a replacement for traditional web services mm -hmm. intermediated by blockchains, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what I think when I think Web3. Now the term obviously has become much broader than that. For the record, uh, but, that is uh, the first time, I, that the first way that I started using Web3 back in 2017, 2018, and then it kind of left right. left the common vernacular and then it kind of resurfaced in the last year. Personally, I just use it because it pulls yes. well and people like it. It does, it does. It is now, it's now like the more, um, pr it's a more respectable way to describe crypto. Web3 yes. like sounds yes, exactly more right. futuristic, <laughs> sounds more idealistic, right? It's more respectable. Uh, um, and so, and this is like, this is just the thing that happens, right? Like with, uh, mm -hmm. with words is that some words get stale and you gotta let them go and you gotta adopt right. new ones. So, um, so yeah, what are my views on, on, on the direction of web three? I think the reality is that every single time I've heard somebody tell me what web three was going to be or what crypto was going to be, um, they were almost always wrong. Mm. And the reality is that we are like, I've been in this industry long enough to know that, um, no one knows where it's going. No one is able to predict the future direction of this stuff. I, the, the way that I see it, like. All of us, all human beings who are participating in the crypto revolution, we're all playing this like big, we're all playing this on this like giant Ouija board and we're all pulling the thing in a different direction. And somebody who claims like, oh, I know what word, I know what word we're, we're, we're spelling. Um, they probably don't know. Uh, they might know the direction that we're pulling in right now. But as more people enter the space, as more ideas come, uh, are, are invented and as more founders come in and start, uh, you know, moving the direction of innovation somewhere else. We're going to see all this stuff evolve and all this stuff change. And so the answer in my mind is like, I, I, I think that the job, at least of a crypto investor, is not to try to predict the future, but rather to pay attention to the present. And, you know, the, the, uh, you know one thing I often tell folks on, on our investment team when they ask me like, oh, where, you know, how do we figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work? And then the answer is like, look, no one can figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. Like, it's really hard to do. That's why, you know, that's why... It, venture is the way it is, which is that you invest in a ton of stuff and most of it doesn't work and a small number of things end up becoming really successful. Um, you know, when we invested early into DeFi, when we invested early into these alternative layer ones, um, it was way before DeFi summer. It was way before Ethereum was congested, right? Or I guess congested in the ICO bubble, but, uh, you know, not anywhere to the degree that it is today. And um, what we were doing at that time was not predicting the future. It was noticing the present. It was noticing that there were all these great entrepreneurs who had genuinely really novel ideas about how to build a next generation blockchain that if in fact we were going to get tens of millions of people into crypto, that that was going to be necessary. And they were building it and they had insights that were real. Um, you know, DeFi in the early days, it was a bunch of nerds who were just like off in a corner playing with Lego blocks. And like, you know, at that time, it was not obvious that any of this stuff was going to be significant or that it was going to be billions of dollars in locked in any of these protocols. At the time, it was just a bunch of nerds in their garages, right? And like, and, and that, um, but like noticing that what they were building was actually really sound, was actually going to work if it, if it really got to scale. And that it was, it was, it was really creating brand new innovations that had never before been invented. Um, noticing that, um, was our superpower as investors. Um, and so I think the same thing, I take the same philosophy today is that like, I don't see my job or even my ability as being able to predict the future of crypto. Um, what I see my skill set as is being able to notice what's happening in the present, to understand it, to explain it, and to at least draw the line out. But the line is super uncertain where it goes. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, uh, to that extent, I'm, I'm kind of along for the ride just as much as anyone else is. Yeah, and it's uh, certainly certainly a, a fun ride. Uh, Hasib, one, one last one, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. Is there any um, just like rule yep. of thumb or life advice or just like law of the universe that you pay attention to and, and follow every single day when you wake up in the morning? Any, any like bit of advice that you think is pretty canon that you like to like to share? Mm. Let me think. A piece of advice that's canon. To you. Um, to you. Yeah. I guess for me, the biggest thing I'd say is that um, your scarcest resource is always time, even when it doesn't seem like it is. So anything that you can do to get more time is almost always the most valuable trade-off you can make. Time being the one asset that you cannot purchase or mint or freely create. And so Hasib, with that, exactly. I thank you for your time and spreading some of your knowledge here on, the, on Layer Zero. 
Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anything, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.